Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel, Trevor Golliger Drums. Today we're going to look at snare drums through the ages. We're probably going to start around about the 30s and work through to the 70s. Possibly uh, we might get to the 80s, but um, this is a generalized sort of description of the snare drums, how they tune snare drums through the different decades. I may do a little bit further down the track. I might actually do snare drums per decade and go into much more detail about each decade. But for today, give a little bit of an overview. And um, if you play different styles of music from way back then, it might give you a bit of an idea on how to approach your snare drum tuning or even snare drum selection. So let's start, let's go way back to the 30s. Back in the 30s, one of the big popular snare drums of the time was the good old Ludwig Black Beauty, uh, the little 14 by four inch. I think there was a few 15 inch getting around as well, but they were mainly 14 by four inch, eight lug, usually nickel over brass. There were some pure brass ones as well getting around. Um, that was really a snare drum of choice for a lot of jazz drummers back then. Um, I think Papa Joe Jones at one stage owned a 14 by 4 Black Beauty. Actually, in fact, he did. Um, there was, uh, and the, the one that he used to own actually just recently came up for auction. And uh, it's a killer, it was a killer snare drum. And like the amount of people that own this. I think it started with uh, Ludwig Sr. gave one to Gene Krupa and Gene Krupa passed it on to Papa Joe Jones. I think Sid Cat Catlett had it at some stage. Uh, Billy Cobham had it at some stage as well. Max Roach, I think, had it for a while. And it's gone through the ages and all these killer drummers um, owned that snare drum. And like I said, just recently it came up uh, for auction through Rockhurst auctions in America and um, gee I wish I had the money I would have bought it just to own it rather than uh, you know I hope someone who actually I hope the person who actually bought that snare drum doesn't just put it in a in a showcase um, for um, so people can look at it I hope it actually gets played by you know a seriously good drummer because it deserves to but anyway I'm getting sidetracked back in the 30s as I said eight lug 14 by 4 nickel over brass snares were really big. Um, I'll try and drop a picture of, of some of the snare drums I'm talking about onto this video as we go through. Um, so uh, hopefully you'll get a bit of a picture of some of those. Some of those really old Ludwig Black Beauties of that era are worth a fortune. Rare as hen's teeth, as we would say here in Australia. Uh, and if you can get one, they're normally quite expensive to buy. I know that one that just went to auction, I think the starting bid was $12,000 US, you know, and they were hoping to get about thirty, forty thousand 40000 for it. Not sure if they did. So anyway, a lot of the drummers back then had them, um, you know, big bands, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of volume and all the brass. So these are in the brass players as opposed to brass snare drums. The snare drums needed to be, you know, fairly loud. A lot of the snare drums of that era too um, were tuned sort of medium to high. Uh, well, all the videos I've seen from that era seem to be that way. They all had uh, real calf hide heads. Back then they didn't have um, mylar heads like we got these days. I think uh, mylar heads were came into being in 1957, the year I was born. Um, <laughs> So yeah, Mylar heads uh, didn't come along to much, much later. So a lot of the snare drums of that period, even if you did tune high or low, had this really warm, thick sound. I've got a snare drum in front of me here, actually. It's a Radio King 50 sort of Radio King replica. And this actually has a um, hide head on it. I'll just hit it, even though I'm only recording with my phone today. I didn't set up my real camera or mic everything up but it gives you a bit of an idea what those heads sounded like. So as you can hear, 
they're quite warm and and, and um, I don't want to use the word sort of thuddy or, or, or sort of boxy, but they've got this real thickness to them that um, high heads um, all have. And um, back in the 30s, all the drums they were using were um, often with hide. And I think even back in the 30s, uh, I don't even think in the 30s, there was real... Um, a lot of people were just using trap sets and a lot of Chinese tom-toms and things like that. It wasn't until really the 40s, um, I think, when we really started to get drum kits happening. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, if everybody, anyone really knows that's watching this, please drop a comment below and inform all of us on that. I know in the 40s, Radio King snare drums really started to come into play. Like I said, the one in front of me here is a Radio King replica. It's not a real one. I've owned a couple of real um, 50s Radio Kings. They, they have a sound about them. I think some of that's to do with it's a one-ply shell with reinforcing rings. They often had uh, low snare wire counts on their snares back then. This one's got a 16 strand on it. I think in the 50s they were using a lot of the Radio Kings had, had, had um, that sort of count. Unlike today where you know, some people are playing like 40, 42 strand snares. My favourite snares are actually 20 strand. I just love the sound of a 20. It's a good all-rounder. But anyway, um, in the 40s, yeah, a lot, a lot of the big players were using Radio Kings, Maple Radio, Radio Kings. A lot of them were 7-inch, um, uh, but they did make other sizes. And they, um, they sound amazing. Well, they sound like this. <laughs> And they, um, once again, to the tuning, tuning of those were tend to be a bit, you know, medium to high tuning uh, back in those days. But even a high tuned hide head to me still sounds very medium sort of tone. Um, it's just the nature of the hide heads, I think, you know. Anyway, uh, out of the 40s, Radio Kings, as I said, in the 50s, uh, Mylar heads uh, were invented. And 1957, so back then, um, a lot of the drummers of that era, depending on the style of music you're playing, started to switch to Mylar heads. There was, you know, two schools of thought there too. There were high people that tuned high. Um, a lot of jazz players tuned their snare drums fairly high. A lot of the blues players, especially the guys around Chicago, a lot of them really tuned their snare drums quite low and... Um, they had that, if you look at or go and listen to some of the um, like chess recordings out of Chicago, a lot of that Chicago blues, Muddy Waters, Little Walter, a lot of those guys, um, their drummer or the house drummer for chess was a man called Fred Bilo or Bello, depending how you want to say his last name. Uh, he came from big band, but um, when you listen to a lot of those recordings, um, he tended to really tune low his snare drum, almost like this one here, you know. So, even though this one's tuned fairly high, probably even lower, very fuddy. I've got a little 4-inch over here that I have tuned reasonably low might give you a bit of an idea what that sounds like actually it probably could even go lower and to give you that sound but I won't do that for now but a lot of the drummers of that era especially the blues guys Tended the tune really, really low. Well, if their records are any indication anyway. So, in the 60s, a lot of the pop music in the 60s, uh, well, in the 60s, they started to um, dampen drums a lot more. It was really from the 60s, a lot of dampening started to happen. And even, you know, 
some of the drum kits they would you know take the front head off before that 30s 40s and 50s a lot of the bass drums were double headed and some had dampening some didn't and in the 60s however they tend to they a lot of the drummers especially the rock pop people they would take the dr front head off fill the, the bass drum full of pillars and all sorts of things to really just kill all the overtones and kill all the sustain of the drum and they also did that with snare drums as well and in fact a lot of recordings in the 60s a lot of the classic songs you remember from the 60s had snare drums and a lot of the time they would put a um a tea towel over the snare drum so they had that sort of sound um, and the reason a lot of them did that too is um, they were starting to use more brass and things in the pop songs and they wanted to narrow, I suppose, the sonic laneway of the drums a lot just so they didn't clutter, clutter up the music in lots of ways. So, you know, everything started to get dampened. Um, once again, too, there were a lot of guys that used wood snares, but there was a lot of pop music done with... Uh, with actual um, metal snare drums too. I think also in the 60s, um, a lot of people were using um, brass snare drums as well, uh, chrome over brass, nickel over brass, just like back in the 30s, you know, the the little piccolos back there, a lot of them were nickel over brass, you know. Um, so there was a lot of guys using brass snare drums for that, for that matter. Um, even in the 60s, Ludwig uh, Superphonics, chrome over aluminium started to come into the play, uh, especially in the 70s. In the 70s, a lot of guys were using um, Superphonics, Ludwig Superphonics, and mainly because of John Bonham from Led Zeppelin. His uh, go-to snare drum was a six and a half inch Ludwig Superphonic. And um, Black Beauties were around then too. Um, I got a... A black beauty over here I'll grab it well it's not a Ludwig black beauty it's a Canopus black beauty but it's the same basically the same thing the Canopus black beauty to me is uh, it's a, a clone of a black beauty that sounds better than a black beauty <laughs> so if that makes any sense that said this is probably out of tune because I haven't played it in a long time in the 70s it was all about volume and you know that's when big PA systems started to turn up and a lot, what happened a lot with a lot of drummers they would put um, gaff tape on their drum heads and dampen down the drums and then mic everything up individually and get the guy in the sound desk to get EQ it to get some sort of tone out of the drums and just turn it up really, really, really loud. Um, that was when uh, drum companies in the 70s even, you know, it was all about volume. They weren't so concerned about tone, they were more worried about volume. And in the 70s is when drum companies started to change their bearing edges from either baseball bat or 30 degree bearing edges. They went to 45 degree bearing edges. And what that did, it made the drums louder. So, you know, all the rock bands, if they were playing acoustically, the drums could still be heard. Also, Bonham, you know, um, he, all of his drums were, you know, 45 degree bearing edges. And he used no dampening. Well, actually, that's not true. Someone told me once he did have a slight dampening in his bass drum, but all of his drums really uh, were uh, no dampener. So fully open, big, open, ringy sounding drums. So to get the maximum sort of tone and big sound out of them. And the way he hit them too um, made them just jump. So um, they were really, really... <laughs> you know, all about volume back in the 70s. 
And back then, like I said, you know, some of them were were uh, muffled down and then, you know, individually mic'd and then, you know, the guy on the engineering desk when they were playing would um, pull up a bit of an EQ and turn them up, so to speak. I remember seeing concerts, concerts in the 70s where the bass drum would, felt like someone was kicking you in the chest. It was so loud and big, poof, right? You know, it had that sort of sound. Uh, tone about it back then or the volume about it back then it was just you know and even if you went to a local sort of dance you know uh, drum kit was mic'd up and the and the bass drum just sounded like a cannon uh, and, but that was the sign of the times that was the, that was how music was presented you know um rock music was big loud and obnoxious that's the way it was so um anyway um that's just a, like a really rough sort of skim over all of the um the different decades there from 30s to the 70s i will probably at some stage in the future just look at each decade and really you know do a lot of research and give you really detailed info on you know what all the main drummers what what brand snare drums they were playing and how each of them actually tuned their snare drums that would probably be a really handy video to do so um, I think I'll probably get around to doing that sometime in the near future. Uh, so we, and we probably will start with the 30s as such. So um, I don't know if this has been helpful, but um, I just woke up this morning. I thought, wouldn't it be nice just to do a generalized sort of video on all the different decades and snare drums that people used. So this once again, 30s, a lot of piccolos were used, a lot of nickel over brass. There were, there were wooden snare drums, but a lot of people were using them. 40s, um, Radio Kings, wood Radio Kings came into play a lot. 50s, um, they were still using Radio Kings. Um, and there was metal, you know, you, you were either a metal snare guy or you were a wood snare guy. A lot of the metal snare drums back there in the 50s, you know, were steel. There was a lot of steel drums around then, but there was brass too. And when Mylar drumheads came into play in 1957, um, that changed the whole ball game in a sense. I, the thing about uh, natural high drumheads, they're really um, at the mercy of the weather. So, you know, if it's a really hot day, um, they tend to... Um, loosen up and on really cold days they tighten up so they can go from really flat to really sharp and if there's a lot of humidity around too they tend to go flat on you so they're really um the weather and the humidity plays an enormous uh, has an enormous impact on high high drum heads so and you know that's why I suppose someone took the time to actually uh, invent something that was synthetic that wouldn't be so prone to the weather. And as I said, 1957 Mylar drum heads came into being and that was a real game changer for everybody. Everyone started using Mylar. Um, they didn't sound as warm and rich as a hide head, but they didn't go out of tune all the time on you. So they were, they were really good for that. Um, there is lately, I've noticed, um, there seems to be a real resurgence in people wanting to use hide heads or, you know, there are drum head manufacturers starting to produce synthetic heads that sound like hide heads or supposed to sound like hide heads. This one here, for instance, this is made by Aquarium, it's called a Modern Vintage. It's supposed to have a hide type sound on it, you know, um, and there's a few companies making hide style synthetic drum heads so it's quite popular at the moment to have that old warm sound i that radio king i showed you earlier has a hide head on it and i'm probably going to buy a whole set of hide heads for one of my drum kits my little bop kit 18 12 14 i'm probably going to put hide heads on that to get that really warm you know old jazz sound to it so I'm planning on doing that in the future. When I do get those heads, I'll, I'll head my bop kit up and make some videos. So I'll let you hear what a whole hide 
headed drum kit sounds like. Um, it's really cool. Anyway, um, I'm waffling on here a lot, so I'm going to stop now. So if you're really interested in certain ear eras and how drums sounded, well, you know, probably my what I would do is go and look on YouTube and look at as many drummers playing in that era as you can and really listen to their snare drums. You'll notice um, in certain eras, you know, a lot of the top drummers tuned very similar. Um, but once again, too, you had two, well, you had four schools. You had the guys that um, tuned high and tuned low, and you also had the guys that preferred wood snares to metal snares. And those guys, you know, wood would tune high or low, and so would metal high or low. So there was a lot of variance. It wasn't just you know, in, in the 1940s, everybody tuned this way. It wasn't like that. Everybody's personal taste, as of today, still applied. So, you know, most of my snares, I like tuning around about medium. Um, that's just me. I love that sound. That said, if I'm playing some Chicago blues, I'll often detune my snare drum or drop it down a little bit to give it a bit more thickness and thuddiness to it. So... Often the style of music you're playing will greatly determine how you tune a drum. And also often, too, the style of music will determine the type of drum you use. You know, there's no point using a, you know, a six and a half a Ludwig Superphonic cranked up and tuned for big, loud, obnoxious rock sound if you're playing country music, you know, or folk music. Folk music often is has really really low tunings and a little bit like the 60s sometimes they would dampen it with a tea towel when they're recording or if they're playing live they'll often put some type of dampener on it a lot of people would throw their wallet on the on the snare drum that team seems to you know be enough dampening for that style of music so it really depends you know what style of music you're playing and um, like I said, what snare drum you use, how you tune it, often is determined by that. Anyway, um, if you're a person that's playing a lot of 60s music, as, as I do, um, I would recommend get yourself on YouTube, go and have a look at all the 60s pop tunes, and really lock in and listen to those snare drums and see how they sound. Um, or, you know, even recordings from that era, you get a set of headphones on and and really tune into those snare drums and have a listen to how they sound. Do they sound really high and cracky? Do they sound sort of low and thuddy? Do they really sustain? Have they got no dampening? Or are they really, really, you know, uh, muffled the bits? In the 60s, I would dare say the majority was really, really muffled in the recordings. Anyway, here we go again. I'm waffling, waffling, waffling. On that note, people, um, thanks for watching this. I hope you got something out of this video. If not, um, maybe the next one you will. And um, please subscribe to my channel. And once again, a big shout out to all the people that have subscribed. We've just gone over the thousand mark. So I great, greatly appreciate all you people who subscribe. Once we get my hours, my viewing hours up a little bit more, we're going to open up a, a membership where I'm going to give you... Um, members only videos we're going to do some online sort of lessons for free for those members um may even offer up some one-on-one -on -one drum lessons as well as part of those memberships so that's exciting that's coming up soon once we get a few more viewing hours uh, um, youtube will let me um set up that in in my youtube channel so anyway people thank you for watching once again take care of yourselves happy drumming um, go and look at some videos to see what what um, tunings people use in the different eras, especially if you're you know if you're playing a lot of 50s music, you need to go and listen to a lot of 50s to uh, understand how they tuned drums back then. Anyway, uh, on that note, people, thanks for watching once again. We'll see you in the next video. Bye. <laughs>